This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. In these past two centuries, skeptics have taken aim at the Bible at many points and in many ways. Despite the remarkable discoveries that archaeology has produced, all of which seem to reinforce our confidence in the historical accuracy of the scriptures, these attacks continue. And archaeologists, both believers and unbelievers, have continued to bring forth their evidence. Today, we will look at one dramatic discovery and the impact it has had on the controversy over the Bible. But first, how about a quick and easy quiz to get us oriented? Who was Israel's first king? That's right, Saul head and shoulders above his peers in stature, but unstable and eventually replaced by the Lord. The next king? Why, David, to be sure. Though flawed like the rest of us, and even marked by adultery and murder, he never forgot that God was the true king of Israel, and when challenged, always repented at once. The third king was as famous as David, wasn't he? Solomon, renowned for his wisdom and wealth, but gradually drifting from his early dependence on God into luxury, pride, and idolatry. Do we know what happened upon Solomon's death? His chosen successor was his son Rehoboam, but he lacked good sense. When asked whether he would relieve the taxes and forced labor that Solomon had imposed, he threatened to increase them. And, not surprisingly, ten of the tribes rejected his rule. It all happened just as the prophet Ahijah had said. Because of Solomon's backsliding, God would tear the kingdom from his son, leaving only Judah and Benjamin to be governed by a descendant of David and so maintain that line. The others chose Jeroboam as their king, and he, fearful that the people would miss the great religious festivals in Jerusalem, set up golden calves at Bethel and Dan as a substitute for the worship of the true God. And so the map changed, ten tribes in the north and two in the south, a divided kingdom. Many of us learned about these kings as children, whether at home or in Sunday school classes. But there are those who have their doubts. We don't need to search farther than Wikipedia to find them. Here's one. Professor Israel Finkelstein is a leading authority on Middle Eastern archaeology, specializing in the early history of Israel. Critical of an earlier generation of scholars who read the results of their excavations as confirming the biblical narratives of conquest, Finkelstein earned a reputation for being a lightning rod for controversy. In particular, his description of 10th century Jerusalem, the period associated with biblical kings David and Solomon, as a mere village or tribal center. And Wikipedia reveals other skeptics. According to Zev Herzog, the united monarchy of David and Solomon, which is described by the Bible as a regional power, was at most a small tribal kingdom. And here is yet a third. Thomas L. Thompson, a leading minimalist scholar, has written, There is no evidence of a united monarchy, no evidence of a capital in Jerusalem, or of any coherent unified political force that dominated Western Palestine, let alone an empire of the size the legends describe. We do not have evidence for the existence of kings named Saul, David, or Solomon, nor do we have evidence for any temple at Jerusalem in this early period. 
faced with this sort of challenge to the Bible's account, many have been intimidated, especially when we have been told that were it not for the Bible's account, historians would never have heard of the great king David. No document, no inscription from antiquity mentions him at all. Sounds bad, doesn't it? But let's not surrender to the skeptics just yet. Instead, let's go back to the map and see where those twelve tribes lived. Way up in Dan, it seems, there is a tell. That is, an artificial hill. The Near East is littered with these tells, each one marking a long history of city after city. For in antiquity, people founded cities in the most attractive places, near water, in fertile spots, on trade routes, and in defensible places. But fire, flood, and invasion would descend on them, and leave them in ruins. Though not for long, a good spot for a city can't just stay desolate. Others would move in and build, but not with bulldozers and backhoes. They'd just smooth things off a bit and build right on top of the ruins of the former town. And so over the centuries a great mound would be built up, layer by layer. And modern archaeologists dig into these tells to find a record of the past. Sure enough, under this tell there are traces of former cities, including one that belongs to about the ninth century B.C. Avram Biran is the archaeologist who has spent several years excavating this city, finding a wide variety of artifacts that tell us about the history and life of the people who lived there. And then, in 1993, you might say he hit the jackpot. But it was not Biron who made the find. It was one of his team, the architect and artist, whose job it was to document their finds. Her name is Gila Cook. Let her tell us about her big day. On July 21st, 1993, Avraham Biran, the director of the Tel Dan Excavations and the Nelson Gluck School of Biblical Archaeology, drove up to Dan. Biran suggested that I go up to Dan with him to finish taking measurements in area AB on the crest of the ramparts. When we arrived, I trudged up the Tel, loaded down with all my equipment, and began work. At around 2 p.m., in the heat of the midday sun, Biran hollered up to me to tell me that he was ready to go. I continued working because I needed to finish what I started. A few minutes later, Biran yelled out again in his booming voice, Calm down already! He was impatient to hit the road and was irritated that I was holding things up. Finally, I finished and came down the ancient stone road, through the Iron Age gates, and plopped down my bag, drawing boards and measuring rod, next to a wall in Area A, at the eastern edge of the ancient piazza. I bent down to lean the optical level machine and tripod down against a basalt stone at what appeared to be the southern end of a wall. Something on the exposed tip of the next still-buried stone caught my eye. But I looked away for a moment as I began to dismantle the level from the tripod. In this brief interval, my mind registered what I had seen. I looked again and said to myself, Oh, these are Hebrew or Phoenician letters. It's an inscription with rows of characters. At this point, Biran's booming voice called out again, Nyeh! a Hebrew ex exclamation of impatience. 
I turned toward him and thought to myself, How do I say in proper Hebrew, I'm going to make your day? I walked right up to him, looked him in the eye, and all that would come out of my mouth was, Come! Biran looked at me as if I was crazy. People usually didn't talk to him that way. Once again I said, Come! Turned away from him and walked back toward the stone. He didn't say anything, but I knew he was following me. I stopped at the stone, pointed at it, and said, Here! Due to the angle of the sun, Biran couldn't see what I was pointing at. So I said, Bend down closer. He got down on his knee, but didn't immediately see what I was going on about. He looked up at me blankly. But then I could see something register on his face. He looked back at the stone, back at me, then back at the stone again, and said, not in Hebrew, but in impeccable English, very quietly, Oh, my God. Here is what they had found. Its discovery, once it had been translated, made headlines all over the civilized world. So what was it? It was a portion of a monument that had been put up by a king of Aram. Here's Aram, up there neighboring Israel to the northeast. But this find was in Israel's territory, and for good reason. The inscription boasts that this king had defeated a king of Israel and defeated a king of the house of David. Putting the inscription into the context of Bible history, here is what the Israeli Foreign Ministry announced. It is probable that in lines 7 and 8, Two kings of Israel and Judah, who ruled at the same time, are mentioned. Jehoram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, referred to as a king of the house of David. These two kings were allies, and were defeated by Hazael, king of Aram Damascus. 2 Kings 8, 7-15, 28, 9, 24 through 29, and Second Chronicles 22, 5. The inscription is dated to the 9th century B.C., or about 850. That is perhaps 120 years after King David's death. Why did this discovery produce so much excitement? Because it is the oldest reference to King David outside the Bible itself. So, excitement, yes, but also controversy. There were those who immediately challenged the find. After all, occasionally one does see forgeries turning up, as shady characters perceive a chance to make some real money from wealthy collectors. And, some who raised questions about the inscription's authenticity had an agenda of their own. Many scholars today consider the Bible guilty until proven innocent, and they do not welcome any evidence that seems to confirm the record of Scripture. And in this case, they were quick to point out that the inscription was not found in situ, that is, in its original position. The stone was broken, and it had apparently been reused as part of a later wall. Some even claimed that it was a fake, planted by the archaeologist or someone on his team. Others, though, stepped forward to defend the find. One of the most respected ancient historians of our time, Professor William Deaver, had this to say. I was there that is, Tel Dan, shortly after it was found. I've known Biran for forty years. The woman who found it, Gila Cook, I hired at Hebrew Union College. I have handled the inscription. I know what I'm talking about. 
there's no way the Tell Dan Steely is inauthentic. All of this was covered by debris until he, that is Beran, started digging. True, it was found in secondary use. Nobody ever argued that it was in primary position. It was reused in the wall. But there is no way in the world anybody could have dug down there, found that wall five years before Biron came along, and planted it. It's impossible. End quote. But even better support was about to appear. The following year, 1994, two other fragments of the same inscription were found, and this time as a part of the formal procedures of the dig, with witnesses all about. That evidence was quickly published, as we see in this quotation from William Schneewind. Quote, two new fragments of the Tel Dan Stela were found in 1994. These new fragments provide a more certain historical context for the mention of the House of David in the first fragment. Once these facts became known, talk about fakes soon died away. But that was not the end of opposition. Skeptics suggested that the expression may have been misread. Perhaps, they argued, the Hebrew ca characters didn't mean House of David, but Bet Dod, or House of Thoth, or House of the Beloved. But the majority of the scholarly community now agree with this judgment by Professor Anson Rainey. The first component is Bet, House here in the construct form, meaning house of. The main accent is on David, David, the second component. The combination was obviously recognized by the scribe of the Dan inscription as an important proper name. There is no reason whatever to doubt the correctness of the reading, House of David. And so, when the dust had settled and the scholars had all said their say, the judgment was in. A king of the ancient kingdom of Aram had invaded Israel's northern frontier and been successful, at least for a time. To commemorate his achievement, he commissioned an inscription and had it placed here in Dan. It stood for a while, but eventually the Hebrews retook the area. Finding the stone, they broke it to pieces and used it as building material when repairing a wall. And there it rested until Gila Cook, one day in 1993, saw something that caught her eye. What has this inscription taught us? Was there actually a King David? Of course there was, but it taught us more than that we see that more than a hundred years after King David was buried, his descendants still reigned in Judah. The line of David, which God had promised would not end, was still flourishing. And as we know from Scripture, it continued generation after generation all the way down to the birth of a child who would be known as Great David's greater son, Jesus, and not just king, but king of kings. Well, do you uh, recall the three scholars I quoted at the beginning of this lecture? They all have successful careers and are respected for their learning. Even so, though, perhaps it would be well for us to pass a note to them. Professors Finkelstein, Herzog, and Thompson? Try trusting the Bible. If you have questions about this lecture, or any of the others in the Good Answers series, you may direct them to me, Dr. Jerry C. Four, at yahoo.com.